<laughs> G'day, my name's Justin Purser. <laughs> and uh, Ben Thompson here from Best Wines. So there we're going to chat to you a little bit about Vintage 2020. Um, I'm the winemaker here, Ben's the GM and grows the grapes. So between us we try and put some decent product in the, in the glass. But uh, we're just going to have a little chat and say how it went. So Ben, what do you think about 2020 as a vintage? Oh jeez, where do you start? Um, yeah, 2020 was quite a challenging year. This year, 19, in sort of May, June, we had good rains. Um, and we thought we were right for subsoil, subsoil moisture and all that, but uh, dried out pretty quick. Um, our frosts this year, we had a few frosts, but nothing really uh, too hurtful. Like we had a few hits here and there, but nothing too bad. We had to get the helicopter in uh, a few times, and we actually had to get two helicopters in this year, one for one vineyard and another for another vineyard. Uh, and that sort of helped quite a bit in, in areas, but um, all in all we didn't really get any, any damage just to, get, you know, the odd vine here and there or the odd pocket here and there with a bit of damage. Um, but then we come up to uh, flowering and, oh gee, what a terrible flowering that was. <laughs> it was great right before flowering. Oh, yeah, great weather before flowering, but oh. um, yeah, we had a lot, a lot of wind, um, very cool uh, conditions during flowering, so our, our flowering was over quite a long extended period and uh, with all the wind uh, it blew off quite a lot of the, the, the flowers on the bunches so it didn't set right so what looked like was going to be you know uh, a very good yield had good bunch numbers and all that and we looked out and did bunch counts and everything wow this is whew, we're going to average seven eight tonne of the hectare not to be anyway so flowering comes along and what happens is the wind blows and shakes the little bunches and that it knocks all the flowers off so they don't set. So instead of say a bunch having 150 berries on it, we had bunches that had 10 berries on it. Some with 20, some with 50, some with 100. But all in all, we lost, a, lost quite a lot of crop during flowering. And uh, to be honest, it seemed to be pretty much most of Victoria, South Australia, and quite a large area that has been hit with um, poor flowering. Oh yeah, from who I've spoken to, yeah. it's one of those ones that it's you won't forget. No. The yields are way down. Yeah, no. but luckily we didn't get affected by any smoke or bushfire, no. so we have got something That's to be good. grateful for for there. Um, also during flowering, which I don't know whether can re people can remember that far back, but in November we had one day or a couple of days where it was I think it was forty six or forty seven hundred kilometre an hour winds. During flowering as well, vines don't like like that as well. So it just they get stressed and just drop their little flowers off the ground and you walk along and see them go, trying to stick them back on. And <laughs> <laughs> but no, so it was really really testing. Then it got cool again. Then late January it got hot again and cold and uh, all over. Poor old vines didn't know whether they were Arthur or Martha. So one day it's 20 degrees, next day it's 38 degrees, and same with people. We are, you slowly get used to the heat, then you get a cold spell and you can't handle the cold. You get used to the cold again, and all of a sudden it gets hot, so it takes a couple. And vines and that are exactly the same as people. You, if you haven't got consistent weather, you can't get used to it. And a lot of that happened this year. Uh, that. Then uh, bushfires, thankfully, we were very lucky, but I feel very sorry for everyone who's um, been hurt by the fires and, and all that in the, in the industry. And it doesn't matter whether it's our industry or industry, any industry, it's very. Um, upsetting, to, you know, for people to have bushfires go through. But luckily, we uh, missed all the smoke. It went round us, above us, to the side of us, left, right, and all that. But so we didn't get any smoke effect in the, in the Grampians region at all. So we're, we're very lucky there. Um, so the harvest itself, everything was everyone. <laughs> everyone in the area was going, oh yeah, it looks looks all right. And then you you get in there and you start picking and. The, the fruit just wasn't there. Um, bunches normally weigh, you know, Shiraz 110, 120 grams were weighing 50 grams. So all of a sudden you've lost 50% of your crop. Your bunches are there, but they're just not filling out. So it was really, it was really, uh, you know, quite, um, not, not upsetting, but a surprise when people went in and thought, you know, they had 50 tonne or 100 tonne there, you know, they've only got 20 and 
20 ton out of 50 or something like that. So, but, but generally, the quality was pretty good. Oh, the quality's there's uh, no worries about the quality, but I always say you, you don't count your chicken until it's actually yeah, in the bottle. Absolutely. And a lot, yeah, of, a lot of growers said, you know, this and that, and I said, I don't, I don't count anything now until it's on the truck going to the winery. Yeah. And when it's in the winery, it's in the bottle, then you know it's good. But at, at the moment, everything, you know, quality, as Justin will tell you, the quality looks really good and all that at the moment. So, quantity down, the quality good. So, we'll just, you know. We only finished picking like last see. week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a bit hard to see how yeah, many yeah. winners we've got yet. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll see what happens. Yeah, anyway, we made it through the yeah. t-shirt. Has anybody got any questions for these guys while they're uh, tuning in? No. Uh, not yet. No, no. So, I can comment from a winemaker perspective. Like, you know, obviously it was difficult, like, assessing the vineyards and trying to work out um, which parts were le less affected by uh, than others. And sometimes we'd have to stop mid-pick because we were coming where patches were a bit thin so they were riper sooner and then suddenly there was a patch like Pinomonia was an example where there was a bit more crop and it wasn't as ripe and um, so and it wasn't ripe so we had to stop so it was like right okay stop we'll pick that next half a row you know the next week but you know a variety like Pinomonia actually worked out really well and we actually got good crops off part of the Pinomonia I mean it's it's weird how the vines, different varieties of vines, seem to um, flower and evolve at different times. Um, so some of them escaped it for for the general part. You know, certainly Shiraz was way down, um, and but you know we still we still got some really good grapes off the old vines of Thompson family, especially. Uh, so you know the quality in the winery. Uh, you know, looking at the wine, is it, like, you don't really have to worry too much about those wines. They kind of because of the quality of the fruit. I mean, we assess them every day and we taste them every day, but um, uh, the quality was shining through right from the beginning. So, you know, I can happily say that I think, you know, something like that is going to is gonna be one of the wines that sort of uh, prove themselves um, with the test of time. Uh, Riesling was also a challenge. The other thing that I found amazing was the acidity levels. Like, we had crazy acidity levels. And we actually ended up having a reasonably late harvest like it, we only finished picking last week so we're in the last week of april which is like considered sort of normal for us but in the last 20 years it hasn't been normal so we seem to be having vintages that are they like pretty much done by the end of march so it was exciting to see the sort of evolution of flavors um towards the end of the season like we had a really cool february and then it warmed up again in march um and then it cooled off again in april but uh it was just kind of weird to taste the grapes as well like even Viv said he'd never seen anything like it we were having um, like numbers of acidity and flavors of acidity that were just off the scale and you know trying to make those judgment calls and trying to pick the, the spot where you know there were grapes that were right and there were grapes that were less right and uh, trying to find that perfect um, spot and uh, I think we we got it right on a few occasions um, it's obviously well, we got it. We got it pretty much right, yeah. all. but you know, we, I think we nailed it on a few. Uh, so yeah, Pinot Mania was really good. Recently, it was good too. Chardonnay looks good. So uh, we'll wait and see. Um, Have a question from the audience. Sure. Um, how is the Dolcetto looking this year? Dolcetto. <laughs> Dolcetto. So let me tell you about Dolcetto. Um, so we've got two blocks of Dolcetto. One was planted in 1870, and one was planted in 1970. So the block that was planted in 1870 actually was fine. It, it, it had a lower crop on it, so it ripened up in good time. Uh, the thing about Dolcetto is it, it's, it's a sort of typically a late ripening variety, uh, and, but the leaves tend to go orange sort of in, as soon as um, we get into autumn, they tend to go orange. So it's not pumping as much uh, photosynthesis into the vine and not pumping as much sugar and flavor into the grapes. So the other, the other block we had, which was planted in 1970, had a bigger crop on it, and we waited, and we waited, <laughs> and we waited. Eventually it got there, eventually we got there. So it was one of the last blocks we picked, but it doesn't look too bad. I mean, surprisingly, it's, it's actually got there in the end, but we were just worried that it was never going to get there. So to answer the question, it's, it's, it's pretty good, considering. So the there vintage. will be a 2020 the, Dolcetto. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The thing, the thing with Dolcetto is, here we've always struggled to get enough canopy on it. So it looked like a big crop, but it wasn't actually a big crop, it was just a really small canopy. You, you need more leaf 
If you've got more fruit, you need more leaf to ripen the crop. And we've always struggled with this block to get canopy on it. So it's just one of those things, if you can hang it out there and hang it out there and be patient, it'll get there, but you, you've got to be patient mm. to get there and go, I oh, know, we want to finish picking now. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, the, definitely. Um, the, the other thing this year was what I found really interesting due to the to the extended flowering over such a long period because of the weather. A couple of weeks before harvest, you go and walking through the vineyard, you go, oh, these bunches look great. And all of a sudden, in all these bunches, you've got one there that's still 50% green. You can still, the berries are still translucent. Then you've got a bunch beside you, you taste it, it's as sweet as anything. This one's as sour as anything. So getting grape samples was really difficult because you go, well, which one do I pick? And you know, and when you're going out sampling, you subconsciously <laughs> you subconsciously grab all the good ones <laughs> until you go <laughs> through subconsciously. Mm. You just grab the good ones and stuff, and uh, it makes picking quite you know when 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 you've got fruit in such a broad spectrum on one vine, it's very hard to make decisions when to pick. Yeah, we did we did go on one batch that did have a lot of green berries in it. Um, but what we ended up doing was actually de-stemming the, the grapes off the berries and picking out all the green berries, which is very painstaking, but it's hopefully going to go into Thompson Family Shroud. Well, I'm pretty sure it will. So, you know, I think that's worth it. But, you know, sometimes you just got to do those things. I've got a question. Got a question. Um, what's happening to the recently acquired sugarloaf fruit? Uh, we, we've been taking... Um, Shiraz off that and Capenna off it for ourselves, so that we're going to a Great Western, the grey label uh, Bino and, and Cabernet, a uh, Bin One, sorry, and Cabernet. We've also um, last year we we took a special little parcel off to try some little different pieces. So what we're hoping is we can find a, a patch out there that we can maybe make another style of Shiraz or something. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. yeah. So, um, any new labels? Well, yeah. So, so yeah. There is a little. There's little wheels turning in the background, and there's some like we've we've been buying fruit off that vineyard for a long time, so we know it pretty well. And uh, when the Thompsons uh, made the move to buy it, it was pretty exciting from my point of view, because I knew the vineyard pretty well anyway. So, so yeah, it's certainly um, been trialling batches off that vineyard for like several years. But yeah, the last couple definitely worked on trying to make them better and, you know, handpicking them and fermenting them differently and um, using different oak and, and uh, really trying to pull out the, find the best fruit out of the vineyard. Um, and I think, you know, we've certainly got something there um, that we're going to keep aside from that vineyard. So that's exciting. Yeah. And the, the plus with the Sugarloaf Vineyard is it gives us a bit more security for the future, especially for, you know, the, the climate change is going away. It's going, if that's what you want to call it. Most of the vineyard out there is out of the frost zone, so it gives us security that way and we've got security for water. But also then we can say, right, this patch here, we want to treat this different, we want to do this different or try something. And then we've also got uh, other areas with there's quite a bit of land ca that came with it that we can use to plant other varieties as well that aren't in the risk zone of planting down here on the flat. So it's a, it's a, um, yeah, it's a sort of a risk management thing for the, for the next hundred years. Um, one more question about uh, vintage, Justin. Were there any major challenges apart <laughs> from the low years? So yeah, we did have some challenges. So um, yeah, Ben, ben, ben was <laughs> part of the so finding the solution of one of them. So when we picked a lot of our um, white grapes, so one of the biggest days of vintage, um, we have one major sort of piece of equipment. Uh, that is our pneumatic grape press um, and we spent a lot of money and time and effort trying to get it all as top notch and ready we to go a, as we can. We had a refurb. Yeah, we had a refurb, <laughs> put it that way. So it cost a lot of money. Anyway, the day that, I think it got a bit of a panic attack and um, stage fright, the day that we needed it to, to do its thing, it burnt out a vacuum pump and unfortunately, even though it's... Uh, a pressurised vessel, it still needs a vacuum to suck the air out of the bag. Um, so it wouldn't, and it wouldn't start up, it wouldn't function. Um, so we ended up using an old technique that hasn't been used at best, certainly not in my time, and I don't think for about 20 years, which is to, um, I had a chat with some friends and sort of came up with some uh, um, solutions. And 
the solution was that we part, we we crushed it all. So normally we put our our bunch of straight in the press and a whole bunch press it, but we crushed it all to allow the juice to flow more freely, and we put it in a, a what we call a drainer or a potter. Um, but to enable it to drain freely, we had to use these screens. Now, these these old stainless steel screens, and Viv was always mentioning this technique to me. So I'm sure he was, even though he was. He was stuck in India. In India. <laughs> he was stuck in India. But no one knew how to use these screens because they have to be slotted in a certain way and they're these clips and braces and like and you have to haul them up sort of twenty meters in the air to actually get them in the tank and anyway, and we found these screens. They're stainless steel, yeah, they were boy, fine. Boys are running around in the panic and said, just hang on, the old fellas here. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. Ben knows how to do it. So I was like, well, who, who knows how to do it? And Ben's like, I've done it hundreds of times. So so Ben, ben really was the saviour on that day and, and helped us get that, those screens in and we had to pick out all the dead animals and bits of bark and tree and everything that were in there and clean them up but we got them in there and we drained the juice and the juice looked amazing. Not that I'm going to do it again Viv but no, if you no, listen no. to this because it was a nightmare getting to that stage but it actually was a good result. And then what happened the next day after we drained all the juice out of the skins we took out the skins from the bottom of the drainer and I think we did 10 basket loads because we've got a small basket press. So, yeah, so it was a different way of doing Riesling, but the results actually were pretty impressive. It's just very, very labour-intensive, yeah. yeah. Um, and the other thing I think that we should mention that we had to deal with was um, coronavirus. Now, that was a, um, an interesting little curveball that was thrown to us during vintage. Uh, as you know, like working in an industry where it's very hands-on, people are in contact with each other constantly, um, it was challenging. So the first thing we did was um, shut the cellar door. Ben and the family made the hard decision. The cellar door's only ever closed on Christmas Day and it hasn't been closed another day apart from maybe 2014 when there's a bushfire. Um, but rarely ever gets closed. So to make the decision um, to close the cellar door was a big one. And being one of the first ones Two. Yeah, first ones to do it, so really sort of uh, was the leader on that. Um, and we cancelled our hand pickers because really, because the cellar door is an intrinsic part of the winery and our staff are in it, our trailers, um, you know, workplaces all the time, to, and we allow uh, visitors to come right through the cellar door and the workplaces, so we just didn't want to take that risk. So it made it difficult, so we actually employed some of our casual cellar door staff to help us pick. Uh, we engaged social distancing, so it was like, um, you know, minimum amount of people in one room. We, we, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we, uh, you know, made sure the people on lunch breaks, so like, you know, we positioned picnic tables, you name it. And we entered, entered like, sanitation regimes in the winery, even though we're pretty sanitised anyway, but you know, just spraying down forklifts and light switches and all that type of stuff. So it added to the workload, but you know what, you just get used to it and you just keep going and you just do it. So, um, you know, the good thing I suppose out here is being a little bit uh, further away from um, major centres of uh, population, so we're a little bit less at risk, but certainly taking those measures um, by closing the cell door and uh, isolating ourselves certainly um, was the right decision, but yeah, That's made it made it interesting. Yeah. It was quite it's quite interesting now that heart vintage is over. Well, there's still a bit of, little bit of work to be done in the winery and that. But during the year, you go, oh god, this is a bugger of a year. God, I wish the wind would go away. This bloody fires, heat, and now it's all over. You go, oh, it wasn't that hard. Yeah, <laughs> it was at the time. You go, but now you just say, oh, I'm we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it all again. It's all <laughs> So yeah, Just take it in your stride. Yeah, I was um, tasting through some of the 2020 Shiraz today that had just finished Malo in barrel and tasting all the batteries. You can probably see it in my red teeth. Uh, and like pleasantly surprised at the quality. So, you know, I think 2020 will be one that um, people won't forget for a long time. But uh, uh, hopefully we'll look back at 2020 best Shiraz and we'll think, yeah, that wasn't, that was hard, but it wasn't too bad. It's always hard. <laughs> yeah, thanks for thanks for tuning in and uh, supporting our supporting vests and uh, um, look forward. I hope you're looking forward to new releases. We've got the Mernier coming out soon. Old by Mernier. Um, so yeah, cheers. See you soon. Right, thank you.